prepared all of this, this wonderful, and lavish, delicious spread for us. Uh, they've not only done that for this morning, but they did that yesterday at, our, uh, at, the, at the seminar in the morning. So we're very, we're very blessed uh, to have them serve in that way. Because let's just be honest, uh, if you were just to ask anybody, not everybody would say they want to do that. Uh, but Eugene and Abby actually enjoy it. Uh, oh, I guess I was supposed to keep that secret. But, uh, <laughs> um, so I trust that you uh, enjoy uh, our time to worship together in service, and uh, now we can get round two. Uh, my hope is uh, after Pastor Mark can say whatever he wants, uh, and it can be some interactive time as well. Uh, so I will. Would be. Would it be best for me to walk around with the mic so that people are. Amplified when they ask their question. Okay, then I'll just be roaming, and uh, if you have a question uh, that you want to pose, I'll, I'll give you the mic so that we can have this recorded. Uh, we there were many people uh, who every week you know serve us by serving in our children's Sunday school, and they wanted to be here, uh, but then who's going to watch the kids? So we told them that we would make sure to record. Okay, and so with that, I want to open our time up with a word of prayer and bring Pastor Mark up. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunities to gather like this. We thank you. Um, we, we thank you for brothers and sisters uh, you know, beyond Elk Grove, and one such uh, servant being uh, Mark. And we're thankful that he could uh, come and minister the word to us this morning, but also to talk about this very important topic. And so we pray, Lord, that today, as, as, uh, as we continue learning more about it and kind of understanding what it might look like in the life of the local church. Uh, that you would bless uh, our time together, that it would be fruitful, profitable, and clarifying. And we thank you so much uh, that Mark can be here and minister to us. And we pray uh, that you would uh, that you would bless our time in your son's name. We pray. Amen. Doctor Chip. Well, I, I'm here to answer your questions. I hope you'll excuse me if I don't wear a blazer. Um, Sunday morning service, I do my best to be John's mini-me and honor him as he wears a jacket without a tie. That's why I was the standard, so. <laughs> Way in Rome, right? I will become all things to all men. So, anyways, if you'll excuse me, and I'll just wear a, my jacket there. But I am here to answer any questions that you may have. I'm here to try. I don't know if you will, but. You know, there's plenty of things I have in my mind. Typically, John, what time do we have until? Three o'clock this afternoon? <laughs> uh, probably, let's just say, let's aim for noon. Okay, that's good. Um, you will find, um, if you speak to any of our beloved members, who were your members once, I tend to get started on one question, we'll go at great length, and then we'll get maybe two or three questions done. Um, so... If you have a question, you need to get out there. Get in front of the line. <laughs> you can ask any time you want. <laughs> oh, what do I have none? John, can you come to the front? She has a question. And, and the question was, what are my credentials? <laughs> Right here. This, this fine lady right here. Oh. Oh. What are your credentials? I have none. I have none. That's the great thing about being a pastor is you can just show up with a Bible and people will allegedly listen to you and give you money. You know? But, um, you know, when, and people tell me this frequently, right? You know, you were a physician, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you know, when you get before the Lord, what's the credential that's going to really matter? I'll work our way back. But, I, you know, when you stand before the Lord, and John will tell you this, there are many men who go through seminary who leave their wives, abandon their homes, and are terrible fathers. And then there are some who are just wonderful. And a seminary degree does not get you into heaven. That's what John celebrated this morning at the Lord's, at the Lord's table. Uh, so, as we come before the Lord, and when we die and we meet Him face to face, it's, what do I have? The only thing of any, any worth, that was, I think, what I was encouraged during communion time and meditating on as John ministered to me, was that when I see my Savior, the only thing of any lasting value is Christ, right? 
That being said, <clears throat> I grew up in Canada. Uh, probably second or third generation Canadian. Okay? Went to college in Canada. Uh, went to medical school in Canada. Did a family practice residency in Canada. And then moved uh, in 1994, a long time ago, in a faraway place. Okay, I'm 52, so I moved back in 1994, young and naive, I moved to Los Angeles to take a job as a family physician and to do family and internal medicine and medical practice. And then I was there with a small group practice. I eventually, I don't know, it was my sanctification. God moved me and made me a partner of that medical group and allowed me to sit on the board of directors of that medical group. It was a small medical group. We had around 35,000 patients at that time. And uh, the Lord used that to sanctify me immensely. And God was gracious to bring me to Grace Community Church and was able to serve there and fall in love with the church. And um, by God's grace, probably along with John, become a deacon there. And then... Uh, go to the seminary at Master's Seminary. So I did a Master of Divinity with John, and then afterwards we did a THM to focus on uh, theology of the human body. What does is, what is God's Word have to say about the human body, the physical body? I was interested in that. And also um, did time in the biblical counseling world there. And those are the world's credentials. Yes. 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 As a pastor and a physician, what are your thoughts on mental illness and the desires of the heart? That is a great and gracious question. You left it very open. <laughs> um, you know, the Bible has an awful lot to say about mental illness. And God has an abundance of counsel and wisdom and grace to address mental illness. I used to um, spend time very briefly with a young man with schizophrenia, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, who came to Grace Community Church. And we would get together and, and pray, and he would always ask me, he said, what I would say um, to this young man, what can I pray for you? And uh, realizing that many of the challenges, the hearing of voices, many trouble things were just overwhelming. And he would always say uh, to me, um, Brother Mark, could you pray for a sound mind? Can you pray for a sound mind? So, um, I have many thoughts, but God has better thoughts than I do. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to, I believe we are in Deuteronomy 32 or 33. And I want to double check on that. You barely find my way around my own Bible. That should encourage you. <laughs> Go back to 28. I was wrong. Okay. When you come to the end of Deuteronomy, God's about to bring his people into where? The promised land. Okay? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, five books of Moses coming to the end. Moses is getting them queued up where they're going to become wealthy. They've got money. They're going to have nice houses. They've been living in tents, right? For 40 years. Good times are coming. We meet at a community college. So I'm waiting for the promised land for when we get an empire and a nice building like the Lord has blessed you all. And this is a treasure. So God is preparing their hearts. Big time is going to come. How are you going to handle it? And he shows them that many times how we handle blessing is as much of a test as when we are challenged with poverty and adversity. Both of them are tests from the Lord, right? And he comes and he shows them, my word is here to protect you and love you. When you walk in my word, that word is a hedge of protection around you to protect you, not only from the world outside, but from your own evil heart, right? And so at the end, he shows that there's going to be blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience. That's not, oh, if I'm so good to do three things the Lord asks me, I'm going to get the big house. It's, look, my word has created the universe. My word has created your life. My word has saved you. And if you walk away, there's going to be consequences. You're going to be further away from the life and love you need to live. 
right? And if you're walking closer, you're going to be closer to the life and love of the God who's loved you and saved you. So as he comes to the end, he shows that there's blessings for obedience and there's curses for disobedience. Blessing leads to life and love of God. Curse is what leads you away, right? From the life and love of God and eventually to evil and destruction. So as he comes to the curses, I am in starting 28 verse 15. Okay? Or you can drop down to verse 20. These are all the curses, okay? And I'm going to highlight and I'm going to jump a little bit. Okay? 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all His commandments and statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall be upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your netting bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground, the increase of your herds. Cursed and the young of your flock, cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. Okay, he's making a point. Old Testament language. Every, as we talked about this morning, every aspect of your life is going to be cursed. Not just your Sundays, not just your business, every aspect. You're going out, you're coming in, your home, your children, your parenting. If you don't obey my voice, all, and it's not, ooh, lightning is coming down, a supernatural, you, you didn't listen to me, I'm going to shoot a lightning bolt. That's part of it, but, but there's a huge part of multiple layers that there's going to be a consequence, an impact on your thoughts, your desires, your heart, your mind, your life. Every aspect is going to suffer from being disconnected from the only God who is holy who's going to give you life and love. Okay? Now, look at this. I think this is so interesting. Verse 20. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you do and undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. And then he goes on to physical illnesses, but he talks about confusion and frustration. When you go to the list of the DSM and you look at all the lists of symptoms for mental illness, You'll see anger, you'll see anxiety, which is another name for frustration, okay? You'll see disordered thoughts, you'll see delusions, okay? Confusion and frustration, okay? That's biblical language for much of what gets put on on symptoms of people who suffer from any number of mental illness diagnoses. And God is drawing a direct connection, okay, between walking connected to the life and love of God who gives order in your life to basically pursuing your own path in your own way. Okay? So, if you drop down, okay, 25, the Lord will give, will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You're familiar with this, okay? Go down to 28. The Lord will strike you with what? Madness and blindness and confusion of what? And you will shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. Okay? I mean, how spot on is that? We're not talking about the biblical Like, God is talking about much of what we define as mental illness. Now, He's not coming. And we're not in a situation where someone suffering from mental illness, say, schizophrenia, bipolar, those are the labels the world puts on. We don't come out and say, well, you must be sinning, and you must be walking away from the Lord. You have to understand that the Old Testament is a covenant context where the society as a whole is going to reap the consequence of the society as a whole walking away from the Lord. Right? And one of the consequences is there are people who are going to suffer from their own sin, but they're going to suffer from the sin of other people too. And men are running around doing violence and whatever's right in their own eyes. And all they're worried about is getting bigger houses and bigger houses and bigger houses and empire building. That's going to have a consequence globally in society. The Lord is talking corporate, right? So yes, of course, individually you're going to pursue a way. The way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs tells us that there's going to be an impact on your life. You're going to have what my mom used to call in a very old-fashioned fundamentalist way, a hard life. Okay, there's going to be knocks and blows. You're going to do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Of course, there's going to be consequences that are going to happen. 
But guess what? There's going to be consequences that are going to happen to your family, your kids, your relatives, and all the people who are around you as well. Because that's the lesson of Leviticus, is that sin sticks, right? And a little bit of sin is like leaven, and it's going to contaminate the whole, and it's going to affect everybody. Right? We're familiar with that, amen? Right? I had a woman whose husband was having an affair. And she sort of knew it, but she wasn't 100% sure. And we went through a Bible study and we went through some of these things. And she said, you know what? The sins of the father are passed on to the sons. What a husband does affects the rest of the family. Right? Okay. So, what do I have as far as... I, I, the Lord, from the beginning, five books of Moses, very, very beginning... Talks about mental illness. And talks about foundationally where mental illness is. Now, if you move forward to Romans. Okay. So, it's not just the Old Testament, it's the Gospel too. Romans chapter 1. And we'll come down to verse 18. To God's wrath and unrighteousness. Okay, so Old Testament history, right? The Jews say, yes, 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 God, we'll obey you, we'll obey you, we'll obey you. But then they live, no, 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 no. And they become like all the nations around them. They get the big houses, they get the big kingdoms, they get the big vineyards, they live big, and they no longer follow the wisdom of the Lord, but they say, we want the chariots and we want everything that all the nations around us do. We want the counsel of men rather than the counsel of who? God. And you see their nation broken. You see blindness, you see confusion, you see madness, you see devastation. You read through the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations and you see the devastation that comes. Okay? We look at America today. We look at our celebration of violence in movies, not just sex, but violence in movies. We look at the celebration of what we're selling in video games, straight through, where we make our money. We look at the wars that we've been involved in, we look at the direction that we've gone globally as a nation. Okay? All right? Are we, whose counsel are we heeding as a nation? I'm just saying globally as a nation. Are we walking closer and saying, oh God, your word, straight my paths? Right? Which direction are we going? We're going away. Right? We're living that out. And, and we're shocked and surprised that. The rates and statistics, you can go online, okay? Not Christians. The rates of mental illness over the last 10 years have been going up and up and up and up and up, okay? When I used to work as a physician, okay, I worked probably for 12 years in the practice before we started to do the seminary thing. The years the economy was good were the most brutal Christmas seasons as a physician. When there was a lot of money in the system, and people were out there spending money, they were getting, quote unquote, this is the world's term, this is not the Bible's term, okay? And I don't endorse the world's terms, but this is a People were getting manic. They were out spending like crazy, and then I would see them, blood pressure's high, you know, pneumonias, insomnia, phone, sick as dogs. I work, you know, I, I, you almost like, as a physician, pray for a recession, because everybody doesn't have any money to spend, and they're sitting home doing nothing with their families. Okay? You lubricate the system. You go on that path of greed and covetousness and all of those things. And what does it do? It winds us up and takes us fur, and the flesh is never satisfied, right? It doesn't give up. We dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper holes for ourselves. And then we have the hangover of depression afterwards. This is a very, very, very tight link. God created, as Genesis 1 and 2, for himself. Entirely for himself, not part of us, entirely. That's what it means to be holy. Set apart entirely for the Lord, for his glory, body and mind. Right? And when we walk away from what holds us together, Christ is the one who holds us together, right? Hebrews 1. He's the one who's holding everything. When we let go of that, everything falls apart. And where does it start to fall apart? Our hearts and our minds, disordered thinking, fragmented thinking, manic thinking. Now you come to Romans, Romans 1.18. This is the gospel, right? Apostle Paul, Romans. Presentation of the good news of the gospel. Guess what? The gospel has something to say about mental illness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Well, let's go back. 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. 
to everyone who believes. That includes people with mental illness. That includes schizophrenics. That includes bipolar. That includes all of those diagnoses that people may have. Guess what? The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly, not confused, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Is there any better description of America today? Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal mans and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in, lust, in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever on them. Have you ever seen what some of the homeless folks will do and some people who struggle with mental illness, what they do to their bodies? Whether it is through cutting, whether it's through tattoos or beating themselves, or any number of things that are there that's going down a path of destroying the image of God that the Lord has given them and looking to that as some sort of hope or relief for what is tearing them apart on the inside but they can't hold it together. Therefore, 24, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. The men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to what? A debased what? Mind. To do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, Ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. You go down that list, okay, and you start with a debased mind, and you realize that there are a lot more people in our society, in our nation, in our homes, in our lives who are mentally ill than those who are walking around with a diagnosis. Because that debased mind covers the interior of the heart and soul of the spirit, the kind of driving mechanism of what drives us, the seat of our affections and desires. And the Apostle Paul here is showing, including homosexuality, including immorality, including strife and division, okay? including fights and anger. I mean, what do we see in the news? What are we seeing when people are walking into schools and shooting children? What are we seeing in the outrage and the amount of hate that we see publicly everywhere in our society? Okay? We're living out Romans 1. We're living out the wrath of God short-term as a warning that the wrath of God long-term, tribulation, distress, and final judgment is coming. God has said, you want these things more than me. You want the big house more than me. You want the education more than me. You want the career. You want the global trade. You want the whatever, the Nike seat. You want all of these things more than me. Have at it. I begged, I begged, I said, I said. 
I preach, I preach, I give you the gospel. You want it, you will have it. My wrath upon you, and you will follow this. And I'm going to give you over to the debased mind that you love so much, and you will see the consequences of it. And yet the remedy as we come through the entirety is the gospel is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. And I believe that with all my heart for those who struggle with mental illness. And in fact, I believe the gospel is the only true and lasting hope for a mental illness because Christ saves the worst and the least among us. Remember the demoniac who had many chains and beat other people up and was distressed and Christ comes and he's totally transformed and he's sitting there with the sound of mind, cleaned up, and then he says, I want to follow you. Jesus says, no, stay here. Right? So, did I answer your... You have more questions. A follow-up to that, perhaps, that is on people's minds is... Yes, given that Christ is the only true and lasting solution to mental illness, what is the role or perspective that biblical counseling has with regard to uh, psychotropic drugs and medication? Drugs. We love drugs in America. I will tell you that. We've had a long history of addiction. We used to have the martinis. In America, this might have been white America, it might not have been Chinese. My, my great uncle or uncle used to tell me that because the Canadian government was incredibly racist and they wouldn't give him a liquor license, they used to have cold tea. So he used to go into the restaurant and ask for cold tea and that's the way you could get your alcohol in a Chinese restaurant. Um, I'm very much in touch with my Chinese roots. But anyways, we have a long, long history of mind-altering substances. It's been there since the beginning of time. We use them, okay? God has given common grace. So he has given us things in this world that are there to help us, okay? But they're not a substitute for the Lord, right? In the end of Proverbs, he talks about wine being given to those who are dying when they're on their way out, okay? But how it is toxic for a king because it's going to cloud his judgment. Okay? And he shows the indication when you go through from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God gives us a very clear use of how to use his common grace. Plants, Tylenol, aspirin, all of these things. They can help. But are any of those things going to forgive us of our sins? Are any of those things going to reconcile a broken relationship between a husband or a wife or a family member? Okay? So they have a role, they can be a help, but at the point that we believe that they are going to be a cure, we're walking a different path than God's Word, right? And quite frankly, the same is true with your hypertensive medications, okay? They're a help. They may well prevent a stroke. If you have high blood pressure, you should take them. But I, I can tell you this is just experience, okay? And my experience comes way below the Word of God. Man has a conflict with his wife. Blood pressure's up. Comes in. Blood pressure's up. Give higher medication, higher medication, higher medication. Finally say, hey, what's going on at home? There's, we're trying every drug on the face of the earth, and we can't get your blood pressure now. My wife is cheating on me. Blah, 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 this, that, this, like you know what, no, no amount of, of pills are going to solve that problem. So they are a help when used wisely in the way they're indicated. But if you go and do research right now within the psychiatric community and the neuropsychiatric community, there is a very strong consensus coming out and has come out for several years now that we have over-medicated, that the... Uh, what do they call it? A chemical model of depression was oversold by pharmaceutical companies, and the results have been limited, and it's unclear how much of them were placebo for issues of mental illness, but in particular for depression. Okay? And that's not, paid, that's not Christians who are writing those articles. 
that's coming as a consensus from many people within the psychiatric community. Okay? And when you deal with the Apostle Paul, when he's talking to Timothy, and he talks about exercise, he says, hey, exercise is good for the body, but it's of limited use. Exercising for godliness is something that is of eternal value. So we have to put it in perspective. So people run around and say, I went to a biblical counseling course, you are taking a psychotropic medication, you're in sin. You don't believe the gospel, you don't believe the Bible. Okay, well, no. That's, that's rubbish. Okay? You know, I, I would get calls from, I got a call from a Christian college where some guy's out there basically throwing feces and cussing people out and is totally looped out of his mind. Nobody at that Christian college had a problem saying we'll take him to the doctor and we'll basically restrain him and we'll give him something to mellow him out until we can speak to him. Right? Okay? But when I went through medical school, one of my unbelieving friends after his psych rotation came and sat down next to me and said, you know, all we're really kind of doing is we're smelling these people so that they don't hear anything and they don't feel anything and they can't really connect with anything so that they're not acting out. I, I don't really think, you know, there's this wonderful new life that they have with these medications, okay? So they're a help, and when people come to biblical counselors, some biblical counselors, and I'm one of them, will say, you have a choice. You have the Lord's way, the world's way. You need to see your physician. You need to be followed by your physician. He needs to oversee your health and your medication. I used to be a physician. I'm no longer a physician. I gave up my license, okay? So you need to see a physician to oversee those things. But you are also going to have to make a decision. Who's going to have first place in your life? Is it going to be Christ or your medications? Now, I'm not telling them to stop their medication, but I'm saying you have to make a decision. Are you going to follow Christ and come under his word and be obedient to him and give him the time and allow him the time and ministry to speak to your heart and the local church to come alongside to begin to address the things of the heart because drugs don't address the things of the heart, right? Is that... that answer your question, Dr. Cito? <laughs> I was so privileged to minister to... Now, this is anecdotal. The only thing you can trust comes from the Word of the Lord, not my experiences, okay? But I did have the privilege of ministering to uh, an older Asian woman who had multiple diagnoses, both physical and mental illness. She had lupus. Um, she had terrible, terrible arthritis. She uh, was totally broken down and restrained. Um, and she also had a number of psychiatric diagnoses as well. Um, she would call and she would uh, be hearing voices. And she would have the sense that people were pulling at her, telling her horrible, um, you know, perverted commands and she could actually feel them palpably pulling at her skin and um, you know she was a regular attender at the church and the irony is as much as John will appreciate this as much as in certain places they say we're all um, competent to counsel which you all are if you're a true child of God if the only thing you do is pray for someone and say I love you and let's see what the word of the Lord has to say uh, but somehow all the seminarians and the pastors and the senior people were always call me and say, I don't know what to do. We have this lady, she's on all these medications, she's hearing voices, I don't know whether it's demon possession or whatever, so on and so forth. So we thought we'd call you, the physician who happens to be a seminary student. So, um, as we talked with this lady and we spent time with her and we went through all, she had been on multiple medications for a long period of time. She had side effects from many of those medications. She had been abandoned by her husband. She had been abandoned by her family. She was living on Social Security in a senior's home. And one of the sweet ladies from Grace to You was picking her up and bringing her back and forth to church. I mean, just brutal, brutal life on every level. I'm just battered on every level, okay? Short end of the step on every level. 
and we would gather together and as far as the voices go and talk about it and hear about it, okay? Many of those medications were working mul in multiple ways on her brain. And it was hard to tease out how much of the effect was coming from the heart and the soul and how much may have been coming from the side effects of even some of the arthritic medications that she was on and how well those were being titrated in the home that she was at. But it was interesting as we gathered and we talked, and we walked through, and I just went through the basics of the gospel with her to find out how she got saved and what her relationship with Christ was. It's her starting point, right? If Christ is not present, if his spirit is not present, the natural man can't understand the things of the Lord God, right? We're at an impasse. If you're, if you're not going to submit to Christ, that's not going to go anywhere. Well, there was a profession of faith. But as we went on and talked, at some point, I don't know, it was probably, I hope, the Spirit of God that led me to say, because she had been treated so horribly and her husband had abandoned her. I had said, are there things in your life where has there been sin or has there been things that you've done um, that are still a burden to you or that you have not had an opportunity to bring to the Lord? Okay? And she said, no, I don't think so. And then she went back and then she said, you know what, I had an abortion and my family, if I remember correctly, it was members of the family who had persuaded her, or people who were around her, who had persuaded her that to get an abortion was the right thing to do because of the really horrific marital situation that she was in. And she said, that was a long time ago, but, and I took her to Psalm 32, if my memory serves me correctly. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 32. Blessed, and, and you have to understand this woman, her bones were completely deformed. She had arthritis so bad, she was just almost crumbling. Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, what? My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is David, you know, and David had sins that he was covering up, he was wasting away. So I didn't go to this lady and say, oh, sinner, because you had that abortion, you're a horrible, terrible person, and that's why you're suffering, and all these things have happened. No, we said, you know what? One job, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all sins and to cleanse us from not some, but all unrighteousness. We have an advocate, Christ Jesus. And... I don't know if that's related, but that clearly is one of many burdens in your heart. She was a gal who, it was not only her sin, but in many ways it was the sins of others around her that she was carrying. Horrible, horrible negligence on multiple levels. And she was bearing the consequences of both sides. And to come to her and to say, look at this. The Lord loves you. His steadfast love is available to you. We can come to him. I'm not promising a cure that things are going to get better. But what we can do is that which is never addressed, what you know, we can come to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness, uncover it, and you can reside at least in that area in the peace and the steadfast love of the Lord that endures all the day long. And we prayed and went through that. And then I asked you to go through the little study guide of Jerry Bridges' Trust in God. Because here was a lady whose life had just been battered from pillar to post and had no control. 
And just to go and answer those questions, look up in the Bible, look at those things, to go through to see that God is sovereign over every event. He has a purpose and a reason. It's for His glory and our good. And He has a plan for good to walk through and to see how the Lord is sovereign over everything. Now, to the best of my knowledge, through the follow-up, when I would bump into her at church and later dates, I would see her with a smile. I'm not saying she was cured. Definitely for a season, as much as I followed and knew, those voices and some of those diminished in severity and intensity, all right, from what they were. Were they aggravated by anxiety, fear, guilt, and a life that was out of control? Were they helped to some degree because her life was slowly coming into the hands of the Lord and the burdens that she had were being carried by Him? I believe so. But as we come to God's Word, it says so, right? So, um, that, that moment was uh, obviously special and precious to me. Any other questions? And you can come back and say, I didn't answer your question, and I'll take another stab at it. I had a slide um, at the end of the message about the, the mind, body, and soul behavior, yes. behavior at the top. Yes. Um, could you give a little um, example or um, teaching on how does a teacher or a parent or a grandparent look at behavior but get down to the heart? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I spent many nights on my knees in prayer asking the Lord for help. I have, I'm have i 52, and I married very late, and that was a gift of the Lord. So I have a 8-year-old uh, and a 6-year-old who are just a blessing from God. I have an old man chasing two young boys. And so I need all the help I can get. Jesus, help me. Um, you know, we're going through, and maybe you guys will have an opportunity. Have you gone through shepherding a child's heart? You know, that's great. And you know what I found, personally, to share with you, is as things were hard for me, I went and reread and started to watch the videos again and just realized, wow, our hearts do get informed by the world more than we think, and we need to be brought back each, each time. Um, that being said, let me address that within the context of, of children, okay? Um, if we can go to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay. Okay, let me walk back a little bit. Do, do we want to talk about this within the context of children? Okay, well, let's go back to Ephesians 2. Okay. Ephesians 2. Paul is speaking to the Ephesians. He's telling them about their life before Christ comes and saves them. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and watch this, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out what? The desires of the body, but what are the desires? The desires of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay. Our children, they're not born believers, right? Did anybody come out of the womb and give you all the points of the Westminster Catechism and <laughs> pass that to me right now, right? Not only the knowledge, but the heart, right? They were, we're all born totally to pray. We're not as bad as we could be, but every aspect of our life. And Paul, as he's talking through here, talks about our past life. He's consistent with Genesis. There's an inner man and an outer man. And what we're seeing on the outside is just a reflection of what's going on on the inside, right? And he makes the point here as he goes step by step down. He talks about first our walk. Okay? Dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Biblical language for your life, your behavior, your patterns. So you see the walk. But then he starts to dig down deeper, right? Who's in charge? You're following the course of this, the way the world works, and you're following Satan. This is, this is how he functions. And then he digs down a little bit deeper and goes a little bit deeper and goes to the desires of the body and the desires of the mind, your thoughts. And very consistently through the Old Testament to the New Testament, in Genesis, right? 
God takes out and he molds him out of the dirt? No. Actually happened. Um, I will show. So, um, you know, he takes out and he molds him out of the dirt and then he breathes into him. Right? And Adam becomes a living being. And the Lord shows that there's a spirit and a body that is in unity together. They're meant to be together. Not one that in our Western society we go left and right. We compartmentalize everything. That is a post-enlightenment Western way of addressing everything. Okay, you got a problem with the car, figure out what it is, do your computer analysis, get into the hood. But you know what we do? We put it all back together again so the car can drive. But in the rest of our lives, we keep my budget's here, my finances here, my, my parenting is here, my body's over here, my inner life is over here. Not so. God designed the two of them, your spirit and body, to be in unity together and in unity with the Lord. And that body is meant to be a physical expression of a spiritual reality. What's going on on the outside is a reflection of what's going on. The fact that we're all, I'm losing all my hair, I'm getting old, I'm weary, I'm broken down, that's a reflection that I'm a child of Adam originally, Christ has saved me, but I'm a living demonstration that apart from God, we all fall apart, we're going to die. Okay? So you have that, it's meant to be a unity. What happens in Genesis 3? Sin comes in, and spirit and body start to break down. And that unity starts to break down. You're going to walk by the sweat of your brow, you're going to become like dust. There are things that you're going to desire to have supremacy over your wife and your wife's desire to have her way over you. You know, all of that starts to break down and starts to get fragmented. That's the way our children are born. That's the way we're all born. So when our children are coming and we see their behavior and their activities, and let's say we're dealing with, let's give it an extreme case, let's say we have an autistic child. He's doing some sort of auto-stimulation because typically there's stress in his life, something's going on, something he's in a strange place, he's uncertain, and he's doing certain body movements to try and give him some reassurance or comfort. Now we look at that with autism, but we all do that. You all do something. You know, when sermon gets long and boring, you start tapping your foot. <laughs> Gotta wake up. You know, when I was at the Master Seminary, I used to take these things called Fisherman's Friend. They were the most disgusting cough uh, remedy available. And during the winter times, I'd put one of those in my mouth, and it would be so, and I would just, okay, I'm ready to listen to the rest of the chapel. Okay, you'll keep that as our secret. I needed something to, to, to stay away. So, Fisherman's Friend, help me learn the word of the Lord. You all do those things, right? There are certain things that we do, and our kids do them as well, our kids get patterns, and many times, sometimes, there are things that are not even modeled by, by parents, right? So an example, I had a buddy in seminary, went, took over a new church, moved his whole family, totally different city, and they're going through the, the, the um, grocery store, totally new city, and you know, the child goes by the candy line, mom says no, and the child lies down on the ground and starts doing a temper tantrum thing, right? And you know, the husband and wife are like, oh yeah, like we model that all the time. <laughs> Every time we have a conflict in the house, husband and wife, we get down and lie down on the floor. <laughs> no, they've never seen that before, but the child is doing that, right? And there's an external behavior that's happening because there's an internal desire or affection that is not being met. And with our children, our children who are not saved, okay, they come into the world, okay, as they grow and learn to make choices, they're going to live out physically and behaviorally what's going on in their heart. And what drives the heart, Jonathan Edwards talked about affections, but Paul's talking here about desires. They have desires. They have desires of the thought, and they have desires of the body. And those desires and thoughts Scripture tells us they're corrupted, like all of us, right? They don't get milk. If they don't get their things, and that's why God has put Christian parents in their lives. And to some degree, you function a little bit like Jesus did with the disciples. The Spirit of God doesn't come into the disciples until after Pentecost. Who is it that's holding them together? It's Jesus, right? And when Jesus is removed physically, they all scatter before the cross. And Peter comes and Peter confesses Jesus and then he says, no, don't go to the cross. And what does Jesus say to Peter? 
get behind me. See? Our children are born as sons of disobedience. Their natural inclination is to act out those desires. And their desires and the way they're shaped is to see that everything in the world can somehow give them the peace that they need, but it's a lie. And so the Lord has put us together as Christian parents to come in and pray over them and to show the glory of the Lord and be the presence of the Spirit to minister to them and minister as we see their behavior, not just to look at the behavior, oh, wouldn't you just stop rocking? Wouldn't you just stop pushing up against me? Wouldn't you just stop shouting and rebelling? But say, okay, my two boys, Ethan and Joshua, Ethan and Joshua, what's going on? You're really upset, and, and typically to do it after the moment of upset, because Proverbs tells you, if you're going to go with an angry dog, what's going to happen? You're going to be bit. So I'll control the situation so that it won't get out of hand. I'll protect them as a father, but maybe, depending on which boy I'm dealing with, maybe that evening or the next morning, Julia or myself will circle back and we will listen and hear because I need to learn what's going on in their heart. And in this case with this pastor, they had left everything. They had a wonderful home, wonderful environment. Suddenly he's pastoring in a totally different part of the country. No friends, everything separate, new home, new sleeping, all of those different things, right? And you know, his child is acting out over something that's just a trigger, and we talk about those as triggers, not causes, that's triggering and showing that there's upheaval going on in the heart. And we have this opportunity to go in the heart and hear that child and show them, look, nothing in the candy aisle is going to solve that the day after. You know that. These things, I know you're not happy being here in this place. But then we get an opportunity to share the gospel with them and say, Christ suffered, Christ knows, and he can carry this burden in his time and his way. We're going to have to trust him in the same way that you trust mom and dad. And I believe Paul, when he talks about uh, in a home where there's a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse, but there's still God's covering over that home, I believe as Christian parents we have that, and there is a protection and restraint on children in Christian homes that, that doesn't exist in an unbelieving home. But I think that's really the direction and place that we want to go, where we've got to address the heart. Yes? We put up your slides behind you. Okay. I wanted to... Uh... Thank you. So, the heart, mission control center, inner life spirit, what drives. Ultimately, that's the area that Christ and biblical counseling has to come give a new life, but also shepherd and transform in order that those other things are going to follow. And sometimes those take a fair amount of time to follow. Did that answer your question? And all you parents, man, I pray for you, pray for me. California is passing the ARC 99. Uh, it prepared pastor to uh, use biblical counseling. What would you do? Do I borrow the record? Do I get to shake my hand in anthem and say breaking the law? I, you, know, um, you know, we we obey the Lord. That's the higher authority that we're given. You know, and so um, you know, listen. This is this is our society. This is where we're going. This is the way it's going to be. You know, just about every level. It's slow. It's coming. It's happening step by step. We're naive to think that it's not. So. You know, it's I think that you raise that and look, Daniel prayed three times a day, right? And the apostle said to the to the Pharisees when they said you can't go and preach the gospel, who are we gonna obey? Are we gonna obey God or are we gonna obey man? We have a higher calling. So try and be faithful and ask everybody to pray. Right? And pray for repentance for the nation. Yes. I just want to get your um, your thoughts about uh, in, in school. I remember them teaching us about if there's mental illness in the family, then your kids or if there seems to be a genetic component. But I want to hear what you think about that. 
Yeah, I think most of the data shows, as far as mental illness goes, and, and you can extend this um, to discussions on homosexuality, which is a really big thing in California, okay? You would come with mental illness and say most of the studies that I know of would say it's multifactorial, okay? There are multiple factors involved, okay? So there's a genetic factor, there's a socioeconomic factor. People talk about the socioeconomic drift that you find a lot of high levels of mental illness in low socioeconomic. And there's uh, an African-American physician in San Francisco who's done great research to show the combination of how poverty plays a role in mental illness and in health in general, okay? Asthma, okay? Any number of these different things that are there. Um, do they play a role? Are they there? Yes is what I would say. But once again, okay, I, I say it, tell people I was born five foot two. Did something happen in the fall that took away a foot from me of what I should be? Did my peak in my prime? Okay, if someone comes to me and says, we found a gene, okay, that shows that there's a link between homosexuality and a gene. That doesn't change the gospel at all. Okay, and it doesn't change the gospel for folks who struggle with mental illness. Because the fall says we're totally depraved physically and spiritually. That means when we come into this world, yeah, you know what? Do, do I believe that some of the folks with schizophrenia or mental illness are higher likely with the same amount of stress that they were stressed and I was stressed that they have a higher risk of hearing voices than me? Sure. I mean, I don't know, but I don't have a problem with that. Okay? Because if you think of our lives, we each, there are some people who are a little more prone to anxiety. His, in the history of the church, Charles Spurgeon struggled with depression. Martin Luther struggled with depression. Okay? Uh, William Cooper, there is a fountain filled with blood, struggled with depression, and it looks like, ooh, there's stuff there that you look in his life and say, I wonder whether there was abuse in his life. Because he's shown a lot of the signs of those different things. Are, are those things there? They may well be because... We didn't just fall spiritually, we fall physically. And that includes our brain and our genes and our genome and every aspect. And is there more vulnerability for some than others? Yes, but is God still sovereign? Yes. Is every atom that he puts together a person? Are we still fearfully and wonderfully made? Yes. And does the gospel still provide the remedy, whether it's for me being sure or someone else hearing voices? Schizophrenics used to, uh, a schizophrenic guy used to come to me and he says, you know, I, but I hear voices, Pastor Mark, I hear voices. I said, I hear voices too. The difference, I got this because I was in the emergency room late one night at a, at, at a psychiatric hospital, and there was, uh, I had the lowly job of getting all the medications together and writing everything out and figuring out everything so I could hand it off to the head psychiatrist. And as I was there with a schizophrenic in this room at around 11 o'clock at night, and I was reading to myself all his medications, right? Haldol, whatever, going through all the different medications. He goes, oh, are you talking to yourself? And I said, well, I guess I am. You know, because I was talking about him. He says, oh, are you schizophrenic too? And I was like, I, I guess I am. Do you hear voices too? So anyways, but when a schizophrenic gentleman at the church was struggling, he says, yeah, but I hear voices, and they tell me to do terrible things. And I would say, yeah, you know what? I don't hear voices in the same way you do. So I, my brain isn't functioning where I'm audibly hearing voices. But are there thoughts in my head that are contrary to the glory of God that I have to say, but no, Christ is king, I love my Lord, that's not truth. This is truth. And I see that as a road home for even people who are genetically, if they are predisposed, God's word is the path to a sound mind and wholeness. Does that answer your question? Sort of, sort of. Okay. One more question? Can you talk about CBT and Christian counseling? Yes. You're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, which has become the rage. You know, Forbes magazine had an article on about it 20 years ago. 
um, and within the psychiatric community are showing that maybe we put too much investment on drugs to cure everything, and there's a need to address behavior pattern, and CBT comes out very clearly and makes the argument, cognitive behavioral therapy, okay, that we're addressing and providing therapy for your thoughts and your behavior patterns, okay? And what's very interesting is, you know, I think many major health organizations have come on board and said, this is the way we're gonna go, and this is what mental health is about, because the chemical world has failed. And they've come out and said, look, this is not coming from the Bible, but the Bible is so much better. How you think affects your feelings, your emotions, and your behavioral patterns. And if we're going to help you, we have to address how you think and your patterns of thinking, as well as your patterns of feelings, and as a result, your patterns of behavior and group and all the different therapies that are there, right? So, a lot of people will come and say biblical counseling is just cognitive behavioral therapy put off anxiety, ill-speaking, malice, and just put on forgiveness, grace, kindness, all of those things, and they're just basically glorified cognitive behavioral therapists. Well, I would come and say that CBT is actually learning that the Bible is true, but I would go one step further. When you look at what our salvation is about, and when Jesus says, and that's why I made that point this morning, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The distinction of biblical counseling is that Christ changes people, the inner life, your desires, godly desires and affections he gives you. Your thoughts, godly truth, right? Affections, emotions. This is where a lot of people don't see. Our emotions are corrupted. Christ gives us new emotions and starts to restore those, okay, and put those back together again. And as a result, behavior and patterns of speech and other things follow. Not because I'm learning, I'm just going to do, this is a new technique, I'm going to do it this way, but because Christ is giving me something completely new and the Spirit is dwelling in me, and there is a power, a transformative power, and that's what we're seeing with everybody who's a true child of God. Does that answer your question? Great question. Actually, we have time for more questions, though. I'm here. My ride hasn't left yet. <laughs> so, if you've got questions, you're asking, are you all dreaming and struggling with those affections of an amazing Sunday lunch that's waiting for you? <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, how do you normalize uh, in an Asian church uh, just conversation and sharing of uh, life struggles or just everyday problems? That is a great question. Did Dr. Seal plant you? <laughs> I wish I had. That's a really great question. I, had, I met with an Asian pastor this week. As you can see, I'm very talkative. It's the, uh, the burden of my congregation. Anyways, um, I had lunch with an Asian pastor recently, and it was very insightful because he talked about reading this book on emotions, a Christian book on emotions, and how it sort of really blew his mind. Okay and making the point that so much of life and behavior was really like Chinese cognitive behavioral therapy. This is what you need to do. Get those grades, serve in church, do these things. Here's the Ten Commandments, and you'll do fine. Right? And actually, when I came to San Jose, I, I struggled because I would, I would preach about the heart, preach about repentance, and many of the people would come to me and say, I don't understand what you're talking about. And I realized before both in the home and in the church, and their experiences was really, just tell me, and some people would actually say, just tell me what I need to do. Just tell me, Pastor Mark, what I need to do, right? Within the Asian community, the inner life, heart desires, mind thoughts, are not things that we were rewarded for revealing, were punished for revealing. As immigrants, now here, it's not just all our parents, as immigrants, we're punished for that too. 
We forget that, okay? We look different. When I grew up, I went to a Christian school. Um, you know, my parents made it very clear to me. They said, there's going to be two standards for you. There's going to be a white standard, and there's going to be a Chinese standard. And it was true. We stood out. So we did the same things. We would get hauled on the carpet really quickly, and we would be those chin boys. And then there was everybody else at the school. We were the ones who stood out. So you were not rewarded, and in fact, you were punished for sharing your heart, your desires, your mind, and your thoughts. And that goes on. So an immigrant, if you say, I want to go to Harvard and Yale, I want to do this, that, or the other thing, people would pounce on you. So you will learn from a very young age to keep it to yourself. That's the way of the world. That's the way of the Gentiles. That's the way of the godless folks. Because we have a heavenly father who's in heaven, and you go to the Psalms, and what does David do in the Psalms? He pours his heart out to the Lord. And we see our Savior. Our Savior is someone who weeps Right? Open displays of emotion. Why? Because the Father loves him perfectly and he's completely safe. He knows that the Father doesn't have some hidden agenda. He knows he's going to die on the cross, but he knows that the steadfast love of the Father endures forever and what the Father does is right. Now, as Asians, we didn't grow up very often with that in our families and we didn't get that in the workplace and we didn't get that in America. So we've been trained to go like this, okay? But as you come, and part of the shepherding process, as you come to Paul in Ephesians, and he says, don't walk the way the Gentiles do. You didn't learn Christ that way. And he's reminding these Ephesians, you need to start all over again in learning how to think, how to desire, how to talk, and how to interact. And so within the Asian community, we, and John, I know you've probably done this a fair amount, we do a lot of small groups, okay, to provide a safe place where people can share those things. I will hammer a little bit my people, right? You can say this and say, don't be so Chinese! Because we'll sit there and we'll ask questions and everybody will sit there and they'll look at me because everybody's afraid of making a statement and that they'll be told it's wrong and that I will think less of them. And that's not me. That's the pattern of everything that they've done. And so to deal with that, we pray, Dear Jesus, give us a new heart and open this out. We love, we shepherd, we preach from the pulpit, we talk to the people, and then we provide and we pursue. No, but tell me how you're feeling. Okay? Tell me what you're thinking. But then we get to the Bible too. Because the other extremes happen within the Asian community. The other extreme is we've got a generation of kids who have come out now. They've grown up in those homes where you don't say anything, you don't tell everything. So the remedy is, I'm going to tell you everything. Yes. Well, I'm the biggest sinner. Slept with three women. Did all these things. I just want you to know I'm a terrible man. Sit down. It feels so much better. It's all out. And it's like, okay, that was not helpful to anyone. It was too much information. And... That's not confession. Confession homologeo is we agree with the Lord with how he views our sin. We come into agreement, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, and we confess to our brothers and we have accountability and say, this is not right, I need your help, Lord. And so one of the things that we do is we're trying to teach through slowly and repeatedly what biblical confession looks like. And Psalm 32, the boys will tell you, the men, excuse me, but they're boys to me. Um, but the men will tell you we've been spending a lot of time this fall in Psalm 32 to show them that opening up to the Lord to a godly older brother or older sister is one of God's provisions to us to take burdens off of us and to pour his steadfast love into us. And it takes years, but as they grow and begin to see the beauty of God's love and how that love is coming through the shepherds in the local church and the people in the local church. God reforms the heart, but he reforms the thoughts, the desires, the patterns, and the walk, and we become like Christ. And with that, let's uh, express our appreciation to Dr. Chin. because it was from God's Word. And, um, you know, this is, uh, 
this is really kind of the fruit of discussion among the pastoral staff. When we look at the life of our church, we, we love you with a very deep love and a desire for you to become more like Christ, as we all desire to be more like Christ. And when I look at this church and I think, where can we grow? I think about this area. And so we decided to start it and kick it off uh, with this past weekend, with uh, yesterday, uh, having a seminar in the morning from about 9 a.m. to around noon. Uh, and then, of course, uh, by bringing in uh, Mark uh, for our service and also for our Sunday school time. Uh, but, you know, it's not just a one and done thing. It would be the beginning uh, of a pattern. And uh, so beginning next Sunday, uh, we are going to start a class, a Sunday school class, during the second hour from approximately 10.45 to approximately noon, trying, the Lord will, um, on biblical counseling. Uh, and uh, it is slated and scheduled to last through April of next year. And so my encouragement to you uh, is if you want to hear more and you want to learn more, then please come. Come and see. Come and learn. And let's talk about it together. Okay? And so with that, let me close this in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the richness of your word. That it speaks to the issues of life. Lord, we realize that sometimes we don't even, we don't, we, we don't even appreciate how deep your word is. And how it speaks to so many issues of life. It's as if we've always had this, your word with us, but then you're opening our eyes to see how, how much it speaks to all the issues that we face, the, the issues that we see, the problems that we encounter. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us new eyes to see your word, and Lord, that you would give us new hearts to be open to its teaching, to allow you to transform our lives so that we may present everything, every aspect in our lives to you. Because you deserve the glory and the honor from every one of us. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose grace makes it all possible. Amen. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I